Today, we're taking a look at a pair of very unusual and interesting prototypes hailing from the United Kingdom. Of a tandem wing configuration, they were certainly some of the more unique looking aircraft of the 1940s, though many still do not know about these strange designs to this day. We are of course talking about the Miles M35 and M39B Libelula. Libelula, referring to a genus of dragonfly known for having two sets of similar span wings, was a designation given to a series of Miles aircraft that experimented with the same concept. From the get-go, this tandem wing layout was predicted to have a fair amount of benefit over the conventional wing configurations, including a greater center of gravity range between the two main planes, which could help to reduce the required fuselage length and wingspan of an aircraft. These characteristics, if properly implemented, would be hugely beneficial for carrier-based aircraft, where every reduced meter of required hangar space is considered very valuable. It could also negate the necessity of a folding wing mechanism, which introduces more points of failure and weight, but is usually necessary for most conventional carrier-based aircraft. The Libelula concept, therefore, seemed to be a perfect candidate for carrier-borne applications. Indeed, it was the problems being experienced by the Royal Navy in 1941, with their improvised Sea Fire and Sea Hurricane, that inspired Miles towards this line of thinking. Miles Aircraft Limited, an aircraft company originally founded in 1928 under the name Phillips and Powers Aircraft, would become one of the larger proponents of the tandem wing layout. This was despite their background in more conventional civil aviation, where they had produced aircraft such as the Miles Hawk Major and the Falcon. Under lead designer Frederick George Miles, development would begin on their first military tandem wing design in early 1942. In November 1941, George Miles had been inspired by the sight of a heavily modified Westland Lysander. He, along with several other designers, had been looking for a solution to the Navy's carrier fighter problem – the attrition rate from landing accidents was now becoming appalling – and he quickly realised that the tandem wing design could be the answer. In his mind, a design rapidly formed. The pilot could be located in the nose, which would provide perfect visibility for takeoff and landing aboard a carrier. With vertical control surfaces on the rear wings, the weight and drag of a tailplane could be removed to allow for the installation of a rear mounted engine. This not only further improved pilot's visibility, but also comfort, as the noise and vibration of the engine and propeller would be as far away from the pilot as physically possible. The whole arrangement could be incredibly compact in terms of span, and the whole airframe would be easy to transport by land, and at sea it would fit on the elevator of an illustrious class carrier without the need for folding wings. To avoid the bureaucratic complications that came with submitting an unorthodox design for official consideration, and because they weren't technically allowed to do anything without the Air Ministry say so anyway, the development of this new aircraft was done in total secrecy. Miles opted to first build a small flying wooden mock-up. This aircraft, designated the M35, featured two high-mounted front wings directly aft of the cockpit, and two larger swept-back wings at the rear to which the twin rudders were mounted. The elevator would be in the front wings, and the ailerons in the rear wings, and a single de Havilland Gypsy Major producing just 130 horsepower would drive the M35 in a pushing configuration. Owing to the secret nature of the project, Miles couldn't exactly roll his new design into a wind tunnel to assess its stability. Because of this, it was decided to build a scale mock-up of the scale mock-up, built to one quarter scale, and to tow it aloft for an experimental flight. Said flight did not provide much in the way of encouragement. The model initially climbed exceedingly well, so well in fact that it threatened to overtake the towing aircraft, the prototype Miles M28, but then when the tow line was released, the model immediately stalled and plummeted vertically into the ground 150 feet below, with zero signs of it trying to recover. Despite this preference for litho braking rather than gliding, Miles was confident that the M35 would behave better under its own power, and so work continued. On the 1st of May 1942, the M35 would conduct its maiden flight. 
Early in the morning, it was towed through the streets of Reading towards the nearby airfield, its short 20-foot wingspan allowing it to be transported fully assembled. But upon its arrival, Miles's chief test pilot took one look at the prototype and said, Surely you don't expect me to fly that? Not to be dismayed, George Miles himself would take over and conduct the first flight trials. It was found that the aircraft was initially reluctant to take off, and to get it to leave the ground, the throttle must be sharply closed while at high speed, upon which the aircraft would leap sharply into the air. After overcoming this quirky behaviour, and successfully taking off, it was found that the aircraft was essentially uncontrollable, though George Miles was fortunately and very skillfully able to bring it in for a safe landing without incident. According to Miles, the aircraft was, in his words, catastrophically unstable, and the brief flight had been a ceaseless battle to prevent violent pitch oscillations. Bizarrely, one official report states that the aircraft flew successfully the first time, it took off, climbed to about 200 feet, circled the aerodrome, and landed. It then reached the somewhat contradictory conclusion that the aircraft behaved quite well, with the exception that it was completely longitudinally unstable under all conditions of flight. Now, it's most likely that this was a second-hand report, and one which was not written by a witness to the flight, and the author of said report instead based their conclusions on nonchalant and slightly biased comments made by the aircraft's designer in a later meeting with Air Ministry officials. A post-flight investigation found that the control issues had been a result of a misaligned centre of gravity, which was promptly remedied with ballast for further flight testing. Additionally, Miles reported that there had been issues with the engine overheating, and to correct this, an air scoop was added to the rear of the starboard fuselage. In the following weeks, the M35 logged a number of additional flights, which were considerably more successful, and the aircraft demonstrated promising performance and handling. Buoyed by this, Miles then submitted a proposal for a naval fighter, based on the M35, to the Admiralty and the Ministry of Aircraft Production in April, who promptly chastised him for producing an unauthorised mock-up of the aircraft, and outright rejected the proposal. Despite this setback, George was not to be discouraged, as he considered the results of the M35 to be extremely promising. He immediately began work on an enlarged bomber design of the same principle to meet Air Ministry specification B11-41, which outlined a medium-altitude, high-speed bomber aircraft that could carry at least 2,000 pounds of bombs. This would eventually result in the M39B, which would also be built in a small scale for initial flight tests and featured a different, though just as unusual design as the M35. The single engine in the rear fuselage would be replaced by twin de Havilland Gypsy engines in the rear wing, whilst a tall ventral vertical stabiliser would be added to improve lateral stability. The general layout of the front wings, cockpit, swept back rear wings, and twin outboard vertical stabilisers would more or less remain the same, albeit enlarged from the M35. However, in order to prevent downwash and improve ground clearance for the propellers, the previously high-mounted forward wings would be moved further down, and inversely, the previously low-mounted rear wings would now be mounted high. The M39B was completed in mid-1943, and immediately handed over to the Royal Aircraft Establishment for formal flight testing, whereupon flight trials would begin on the 22nd of July. These trials would predominantly be undertaken by George Miles and Flight Lieutenant H. V. Kennedy, and despite some setbacks involving the landing gear collapsing, overall handling characteristics were deemed to be fairly good. Some small alterations were needed to improve stability during takeoff and landing, mainly shifting the centre of gravity a little, and some minor trim adjustments, but on the whole, these changes were not major. As a small-scale mock-up with placeholder engines, the aircraft was of course significantly slower than its intended full-scale production version, reaching a maximum speed of just 164 miles an hour. Its smaller size also brought with it another unexpected problem. 
It was reported that due to the lightweight construction of the fuselage, the cockpit would experience alarming lateral oscillations, and the entire front of the fuselage would warp and bend from side to side, which made for some hair-raising moments in its earlier flights. But this was soon fixed by the addition of heavier gauge ply skin. The M39B received plenty of praise, with test pilot Don Brown reporting that the aircraft showed no sign of longitudinal instability or other undesirable characteristics. On the contrary, it handled perfectly normally, like any other twin of its power, and with the additional advantage of no swing on takeoff and no wing drop at the stall. Though not officially tested with it, the aircraft was planned to have a fairly impressive armament, capable of holding up to 6,000 pounds of ordnance in its bomb bay, along with mounting twin 20mm cannons in the canards. Carrying such a load was not to be a problem, even during takeoff from a smaller airfield. A typically ingenious mechanism had been devised by Miles, allowing the elevator to be operated normally over their full range on the rear wing, but when the flap was deflected, the elevator mechanism was also activated, allowing the flap and elevators to work in unison. This also had the benefit of greatly reducing the stall speed of the aircraft during takeoff, which was often the most dangerous time for a bomber crew, other than encounters with the enemy, of course. Development of the M39 would remain a private venture until September of 1943, several months after its completion, when it piqued the interest of the British Air Ministry, who offered a formal development contract. Perhaps optimistically, attempts were also made to garner interest from the US Army Air Force, after it came to Miles' attention that they were working on the XP-55, which shared some design features with the M39. This would ultimately fall through, though, as the XP-55's flight testing had left right field of the opinion that the design was not worth further development. Despite the official backing from the Air Ministry, only a single prototype of the M39B would be produced. The specification to which it had been built was actually cancelled before the aircraft was even complete. But instead of ordering it scrapped, the M39B was taken from Miles and put through an accelerated test program at RAE Farnborough. This was done to explore the feasibility of the tandem wing design in an envisioned high-speed jet bomber instead, to which Miles may have still received a production contract. But at the conclusion of said trials, the benefits of tandem wing aircraft were now being nullified by those of rear-facing jet engines, which allowed the same visibility and advantages that the Libelula designs had boasted, and after a period of further testing back at miles, the M39 was eventually scrapped. In such a climate of rapid development, the M39B stood no real chance against its emerging jet-powered competitors. The earlier M35 might have had more luck, had the Air Ministry shown some initiative, but it's impossible to say how successful it would have really been. As such, they remain an unusual and fairly unknown aircraft, despite their striking aesthetics, a good concept that was simply overshadowed by an emerging technology. Now, if you want to find out more about these fascinating designs, fear not, for I am working on one of my longer deep dive videos, where I will cover the entire series of Experimental Miles aircraft in detail, for there were quite a few, but that is a topic for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons, whose names you will see here. With Christmas just around the corner, I'll be taking some time to myself, but there should probably be at least one more video for December after this, so keep an eye out for that, and hopefully I'll have some channel news in the not-too-distant future. A big thank you as well to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our top tier members. Uh, once again, Patreon is being a bit slow with updating my list, so if I have missed anyone, I apologise in advance and I'm probably going to put up some polls this week, or next week, for some video ideas for next year, so please stand by for further details. But, as always, thank you all so much for your continued support, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.